At the beginning of Canto 28, Dante is lost in a forest. He writes, Already my slow steps had transported me into the ancient wood so far that I could not see back to the place whence I had entered. In this way, Dante reenacts the very start of the Divine Comedy, where in Inferno 1 he finds himself lost in a dark wood. Fortunately, this wandering indicates a new beginning for him, and he will soon learn that he is in earthly paradise. It may be meaningful that our pilgrim reaches earthly paradise in the 28th canto. 28 may have been an important number for Dante. In his earlier work, La Vita Nova, Beatrice dies in chapter 28, and 28 was also considered a perfect number because its divisors 4 and 7 were also significant, 4 for the four Gospels and 7 for the Sabbath. We might also remember that this is the seventh day of Dante's journey, and he has finally found a place of rest. As he strolls deeper into the wood, we experience with him the fragrant air, the sweet breeze, the ethereal birdsong. He tells us, I left the bank, taking the plain slowly, slowly, over ground that breathed fragrance from every side, a sweet breeze, unchanging in itself, struck my brow with no greater force than a gentle wind by which the pliant branches trembling were bent, all of them toward where the holy mountain casts its earliest shadow, but not parted so much from their straightness that the little birds in the treetops left off exerting their every art." End quote. The forest which flourishes with every form of plant life grows spontaneously and is sustained by a fountain of divine source. It is a self-generating, self-sustaining environment, and Dante is a harmonious figure in this landscape. He too is now, in a sense, self-sufficient, having been crowned and mitered lord over himself in the previous canto. And for the first time, he steps out ahead of Virgil and Statius. Coming to the bank of a clear stream, he sees a beautiful woman singing, dancing, and gathering flowers, an image of a pristine Eve to Dante's restored Adam. He pleads with her to come closer so that he might better hear her song, and gives us three images from classical mythology. First, he compares her to the beautiful Proserpina, who was also collecting flowers when she was abducted by the god of the underworld. Second, he compares her eyes to those of Venus when she was struck by one of Cupid's arrows. Third, he compares his separation from the beautiful woman by the stream between them to the plight of the lovers Leander and Hero who lived separated by a waterway. We may observe that all three illusions recall moments of happiness before a tragic loss. Proserpina's abduction and violation cause her grieving mother, the goddess of agriculture, to bring about winter instead of lasting spring. Venus, being struck inadvertently by one of her son's arrows, leads to her falling in love with the mortal Adonis, who later dies in her arms. And Leander, who swims the waters of the Hellespont every night to reach his love, eventually drowns while attempting to cross on a winter night. It seems that Dante cannot help but evoke the specter of loss. For Dante, and for many of us, it may be difficult to conceive of an Eden that is not haunted by the prospect of a fall. He may, however, overcome this limitation as he passes through earthly paradise, and especially its rivers, which I will return to in a moment. We might also note that the three illusions reference stories that are sexually charged, suggesting that Dante experiences a sexual desire for the beautiful lady, and that perhaps the desire is mutual. This is intriguing, however, since we will remember that he has just been through a fire purifying him of all carnal lust, and that the previous canto ended with instructions to let pleasure be his guide. Somehow, this longing must be appropriate and good, with sensual desire perhaps now representing spiritual desire. In this way, earthly paradise, as even its name suggests, is a place of paradoxes. 
a paradise, and yet also earthly, a place where a lady can be like Venus and yet virginal, a place where Dante can feel desire, and yet it is totally pure. The lady cheerfully answers Dante's questions, providing a lesson on the climate and vegetation of earthly paradise. Most importantly, she introduces him to two rivers, flowing from a single divine source through which he must pass in order to be completely prepared for paradise. Like the other treatments of purgatory, the rivers serve a dual function, both purging and also restorative. The first, Lethe erases all memory of sin, which may yet remain, though he has been cleansed of his sin. And the second, Yunai, restores memory of every good deed. For her great depth of knowledge, this as yet nameless lady has been compared to the Lady Wisdom in the Book of Proverbs. We could then say that it is reason, whom Virgil is often understood to symbolize, who guides Dante to wisdom, and it will be wisdom who leads him to revelation, as represented by the figure of Beatrice in Paradise. At the end of her tutorial, the lady offers Dante what she calls a corollary, a kind of bonus insight. She reminds Dante of the classical myth of the Golden Age, which imagined a time when men were good, the world was at peace, and the earth enjoyed unending spring and explains that the poets who dreamed of this golden age were approximating earthly paradise, for human dreams of idyllic bliss find their origin here. She says, Those who in ancient times wrote in their poetry of the age of gold and its happy state, perhaps on Parnassus dreamed this place. Here the human root was innocent, here there is always spring and every fruit. This is the nectar of which each one tells." End quote. At this, Dante looks back to see Virgil and Stacia smile at her affirmation of the poets. If in the Inferno we saw Dante feeling honored simply to be included in the circle of the ancient poets, here we see that he now surpasses them. While the ancient poets may have had visions of Eden, he has regained it and is now leading us through it as well. <laughs>